Good evening. It is my true pleasure to introduce Mark Elliott. He is a New York Times bestselling author of more than a dozen books on popular culture, among them the highly acclaimed biographies of Cary Grant and Jimmy Stewart, as well as the award-winning Walt Disney Hollywood star Prince. Uh, I would like to mention others that I love that are here in display in case you want to zero in, or I encourage you to Google his name and look at the immense number of books that he has produced. Mark obtained a PhD from Columbia University in New York. Um, he has always says that he's a, uh, his, one of his mentors was Andrew Saris, one of uh, legendary professors at the Columbia University. Mark has also written on media and popular culture for Penthouse, LA Weekly, and California Magazine. He's a visiting professor at the School of Film and Visual Arts of the Universidad Francisco Marroquin, where he teaches the course World of Cinema, the Art of Film. Please give a round of applause to Mark as he joins us on stage. Uh, so we'll start with, uh, with a very simple question. We have all seen the big sign in Mount Lee that reads Hollywood. Uh, we all know that it used to read Hollywood Land. But can you tell us exactly what is Hollywood? Is it a place? Is it an idea? What is it? Wow, what an opening uh, question. <laughs> it's like a Muhammad Ali throwing the first <laughs> round punch. Um, Hollywood was um, a small, unincorporated town uh, in Los Angeles that was originally an orange grove. Uh, before or after the missionaries um, had most of the property in L.A., um, orange groves became the, the, big, um, the big industry. Uh, when the immigrants from New York, who were the pioneers of film, for a number of reasons, which I won't go into here, um, they had to leave New York. They had to leave the East Coast. And uh, I, I'm talking about um, uh, Cohn, uh, Louis B. Mayer, uh, Cecil B. DeMille, uh, Sam Goldwyn, all the names that you see at the beginning of these films. Uh, they all started out uh, on the Lower East Side as immigrants, uh, usually making clothes or selling trinkets or uh, with fruit carts. And to make some extra money, when, when uh, moving pictures, not film, moving pictures became such a, um, such a fad in the early 1900s, they would hang a sheet in, in their storefronts or wherever they had room, put up a few chairs, and people would start coming. They wanted to see this phenomenon. But eventually, they ran into uh, trouble with um, those people who were making the film, making the actual physical film, and um, they couldn't get negative. They couldn't get a, a raw stock to shoot on because, uh, for, among many reasons, one of them was that it was a copyrighted um, piece of uh, uh, equipment by Thomas Edison. Now, Edison. Uh, did not like the use of film as a novelty. He was a very practical inventor, and he wanted film to be used like uh, tape recorders or phonographs for practical purposes. He, he thought the invention of the phonograph was so that uh, um, secretaries could transcribe what, uh, what was recorded on there. There was no sense of entertainment. He, he looked at entertainment as something crude, primitive, and that uh, immigrants were uh, um, not only more attracted to, but responsible for the low level of uh, these few films that they used to show. So in order to get negative stock, they, they bought it as everything happens in America on a black market. Uh, and uh, they were able to continue 
to make films and show films. So Edison created what was known as the trust. And the trust, be another word for gangs and thugs, he went into um, to these early immigrants and used physical violence to destroy whatever equipment they had, uh, their storefronts, and in some cases threatened their lives. So they had to move out of New York and they moved to the farthest place they could go in America that had sunlight. Uh, and so they chose Southern California. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, Los Angeles was so sparse, there were so few people there besides the missionaries that once film became uh, an infant industry in Hollywood strictly for practical purposes uh, because uh, if you wanted to shoot, you needed light, um, natural light. So all these studios had open ceilings, uh, open roofs, so you could shoot. Hollywood's a great place for that. Um, and then land, people, as more people came to Hollywood, uh, a couple of clever real estate agents decided to advertise real estate. And that's what Hollywood land means. It was an advertisement for people to buy property in this development called Hollywood land. Secondly, Hollywood is an industry uh, as it developed. And um, it's always very difficult in an industry to introduce art. Uh, they, they seem to be um, the opposite sides of the spectrum. They, um, one wants to manufacture every piece exactly like the previous one. And the other side wants to do something new. And so there was a butting of the heads in Hollywood right from the start between the creative end and the industrial end. As they slowly came together, uh, a lot of things happened, which I'm going to tell you a little bit about. The third thing about Hollywood is that Hollywood is, is as you say, an idea. It's also come to have a meaning um, with film that gives it a certain gloss, a certain sateen finish that means if you're Hollywood, if you've made Hollywood films, you've made films uh, that come from uh, the ground zero of filmmaking uh, from around the world. That is the point meridian of filmmaking. So land, industry, idea, and immigrants. So when uh, when we talk about immigrants today, especially in America, and I'm sure you see it on the news every day, nothing has changed. Uh, immigrants uh, drive the nation as workers, and they are resented as, um, as being uh, um, not belonging. So back then, as they started to make films, and remember, these are European immigrants, uh, penniless, who hit on a novelty that allowed them to go to Hollywood and make enormous amounts of money. But they ran the studios uh, like Europe ran its industries. They wanted people to think of working at a studio as a privilege that they were getting a job, they were making some money, uh, they were doing something exciting, they had a home, food on the table, and that they, the workers, owed the, um, the moguls, as they called them, the, the owners of the studios, they owed them something for the privilege of working. And just as, a, as, as an aside, when you watch Hollywood films, you almost never see wealthy people as heroes. You always see wealthy pe people 
as you know, uptight and uh, worried about the money and uh, uh, what are we gonna do when this, and young people falling in love and uh, there's no problems. Even though they may not have any money, you know, what's money when you fall in love? I mean, that's something young people everywhere believe in and that's an idea that comes out of Hollywood, really, at the beginning of the 20th century. Sell something, sell a product that people want to see that will get them out of the grim realities of where they live. Now here's where Hollywood takes an awful turn. And this is, this is what eventually led to the end of the industry, of the uh, real estate, and finally the idea. Eventually, the workers decided that the only way that they could have any say in their, in their lives, you know, writers would work, there would be 25 writers in the writer's room. And it would be like crickets in August, you know, at the old year, the clack, clack, clack of the typewriters. Seven days a week um, uh, in the beginning. Uh, if, you, uh, if you had technicians building sets, seven days a week. And the idea was to put out as much as possible to make the most money, and that these people were workers. Uh, and um, they had little to do as a cohesive whole with the product that was putting out. Think uh, it was putting out. Think of uh, Detroit and the assembly line, where you know you work on a fender, you work on a tire, uh, you work on a mirror, but you don't work on the whole car. You don't see the whole car. Uh, that I mean, Hollywood is basically uh, uh, a, an assembly line of workers, or it was in those days, when the workers decided uh, that they would follow the then popular idea of workers of the world uniting. I don't think I have to tell you where that comes from. Um, they started to form unions. This infuriated the moguls. And to counter the union movement, which they considered illegal, and most most unions by at at that time were considered illegal in uh, the states. They formed a house union. Each studio formed a house union. Now, what is a house union? It's a, it's a union run by management. So it's not really a union at all. It's just uh, it's the same old thing with a new name on it. It didn't really satisfy the workers. So the, uh, the heads of the studios got together and they said, what can we do to make these people happy? And one of them got the brilliant idea of giving little statues uh, once a year to the best films ever made. And that, my friends, is how the Academy Awards came about. Uh, it was an anti-union, um, what they considered a compromise, and because they, they thought of workers as not too bright and uh, easily swayed and they owed them everything, they thought a little prize, like you would give kids uh, in, in a contest, and that would make everybody happy. Well, guess what? It didn't make everybody happy. Uh, it only infuriated uh, everybody, and unions began to form. By 1932, when uh, FDR Roosevelt was elected, he legitimatized unions with something called the Wagner Act. The Wagner Act made it legal for unions to be formed, and that is the beginning of the end of Hollywood. Hollywood begins officially 1915 with birth, uh, uh, aptly called birth of a nation. You could also call it uh, birth of an industry. And it ends in 1966 with uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. So what do you have? You have a 50 year industry. Let's go back to Ford or Coca-Cola. I mean, these are industries that are over a century old and getting bigger. 
uh, you walk out here, you can buy a Coca-Cola that's worldwide. And um, the problem with the industry, the reason why it was so short-lived was because first they had a problem with censorship. That, that was always a problem uh, in, in Hollywood. The government, um, for the first few years from when uh, films, when talkies came in, which really begins 22 or 23, but is officially uh, considered 1927 or 28 with, with uh, um, the Al Jolson uh, film. But that's not really the beginning of sound. That's, that's kind of the official beginning. As sound films came in, and these moguls, always interested in the bottom line, started showing, making films and showing people what they thought they wanted. Beautiful women, half naked, uh, handsome leading men, um, stuff that tended to be a little on the racy side. Well, uh, Washington, which never liked uh, Hollywood, and I will tell you why if you want to know later, um, warned the industry that unless they cleaned up their act, they would impose censorship. Uh, and in one of my classes last year, we went through the 20 pages of rules. Those rules are the reason that you never see black people in any role in a film other than a dim-witted waiter or a guy scared of his own shadow or a, a maid. Racism, yes. But the idea was that if you promote minorities in a film, you won't have an audience because the majority of people in those days were white, middle-class people who wanted to see white, middle-class people in film. So, you know, you can't just say racism, you can't just say uh, bottom line. The whole concept of making money uh, through an art form in Hollywood from the producers and mogul's point of view was show the same thing over and over again. Raise the dresses a little bit, drop the tops a little bit, just enough so that audience says, oh, well, I want to see uh, this, this woman, that woman. And that's really the beginning of the star system where uh, that and the invention of the close-up create the star system. And people wanted to see these actresses mainly and the men who go gaga over them in films. Washington said it was going to impose uh, a, a censorship system based on the one that England does still has. Uh, when you, whenever you see a, a British film, you see this is certified by the board and so forth. Uh, that's one of the reasons British cinema never really became a major player in world film. That's one of the reasons. They had a choice. They gave, they gave the moguls a choice. Change your ways, make a self-imposed uh, system, self-censorship, and we'll keep an eye on you, but we won't stop you from making films. But behave yourself. That's essentially what they were saying. Hollywood did that. That created the Hayes Code, uh, which uh, stayed in effect. So that's, that comes in 1932, when if you see films before 32 or, or 33, You'll, and occasionally uh, you can see them, um, you can find them. They're very racy stuff for uh, that time. Uh, and after the Hayes Code comes in, suddenly women become these chaste, virginal sweethearts. And what's so interesting about it is the men become the villains. They're the ones who, um, rather than the beautiful women pre-code corrupting men with their, you know, their skimpy clothes, everything reverses. 
men became the villains in these movies. And that's why when you have villains, you have heroes. And that is how the standard Hollywood film was developed. So all these outside forces, unions, censorship, uh, and the need to repeat all of, all of these popular ideas. That's what Hollywood was. Uh, it was an industry of creativity, which, uh, you know, is uh, kind of a, uh, um, uh, you know, a conflict of ideas. Uh, it, it really doesn't, uh, it, it's hard to mesh. And the reason why Hollywood is an art form is in spite of all that, there were certain directors who were able to sneak films through the system. Uh, in, in those days, it was the moguls who were all bottom line men. They, they were all, all about money. Producers were at the top of the scale of uh, power. They were the ones who were responsible taking care of individual films. Next came screenwriters. Uh, they, you know, Hollywood obsessed with content and story. Um, they had the next level of power. Below them, actors. Uh, actors never had much power in the studio system. They signed contracts, and whatever uh, came their way, they were instructed to play those roles. Even though they didn't want to necessarily, if they didn't do what the studio told them, they went on something called suspension. So if they signed a 10-year contract and they refused to make a certain film, that time would be added to the contract. I mean, you know, all this outrageous uh, um, stuff that was going on. And all the way at the bottom of the pile of uh, power were the directors. And that, that actually... Uh, worked very well because as directors they were able to formulate something that is the real creation of Hollywood. Metaphor. The only way they could get to say what they wanted to say was by creating a style of metaphor. And when we look at Hollywood films today studio films, we are looking at the style versus the status quo. The individual versus um, the studio industry. And that, that creation of metaphor is really Hollywood's great contribution as an art form. Now, what do I mean? Well, I'll be happy to tell you. Um, Hollywood is an historical medium, meaning that it doesn't, it doesn't predict uh, what is happening or even cover what is happening now. Uh, it deals with what has happened in the past. And by the time a film comes out a year or two later, um, new things have happened. When, when the Depression hit, uh, the Great Depression uh, in uh, the world, Hollywood was still making films that uh, didn't even acknowledge that there was uh, anything wrong uh, with, uh, with uh, the economics of the world. So people who work live in these enormous apartments. Uh, they have butlers. They have, uh, they have valets. They, they have everything in the world. And they're working at jobs that we never see. Uh, Hollywood didn't want to show you the toil. They just wanted to show you um, the results of the system, how great the system was, the, de the democratic political system, because look how great these people were living. And then when the Depression hit and the censorship code came in, now you have Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Take any film of theirs in the 30s. What did they do for a living? Nobody knows. Um, uh, she may have been a chorus girl in uh, a couple of films, and chorus girls in Hollywood were not chorus girls 
in real life. Uh, they were, you know, female uh, objects of desire, as I told you before. So Fred Astaire asks Ginger Rogers in any of these films if she'd like to dance. Usually they, they're either on a stage or in Central Park, uh, which is Hollywood, a sound studio to look like Central Park. And uh, they dance, they kiss romantically, and then she says, like all good girls in Hollywood, uh, I have to go, I have to go home. And what does he do? He goes back and dances by himself. Um, with uh, with a sense of ecstasy, uh, what what is what does that mean? I mean, I, you you know what it means, um, but it's the metaphor of dancing for joy that replaces the more concrete, the more explicit sexual notions. So his dancing becomes a metaphor for his sexual feelings, and that is how art begins to work in Hollywood. Uh, these directors who uh, were working by putting metaphor on screen, the producers didn't know what they were doing, the moguls didn't care what they were doing, uh, uh, screenwriters uh, didn't understand that film was not about the word, it was about the image, and that's how film progressed. So Hollywood, became, for the rest of the world, the ideal of freedom, which it really wasn't, of fairness, which it really wasn't, of uh, equality, which it really wasn't, and that nobody had sex uh, in, uh, in Hollywood on film. So America's puritanical nature perfectly reflected uh, on the screen. And so the rest of the world, as they got to see American movies, they wanted to live what they thought was the American dream. Um, and that, that's Hollywood. Uh, that's my long way around of telling you what Hollywood means. Well, I, um, I am very thankful that you took us back to the origins because many of the students today here are actually working towards building an industry in Guatemala that can make films as Hollywood did about 120 years ago. So it's very, very useful to, for us to know that deep history and complicated relationship between money, talent, art, and all those things that you mentioned that I was trying to diagram um, in my head because they're very complex but very useful. So. Before we go into the questions, we'll have questions. Please uh, write down your questions or prepare them for later. Uh, I also would like to know, why do you consider a Hollywood icon? Is it an artist? Is it a product? Is it a myth? And uh, if you would like, and please share with us, who of today's actors would you consider as one of these new Hollywood icons? Yes my answer to that question. <laughs> um, it's, it's all of those. Uh, it, it's all of those. Um, it, you, you know, once the studio system, let me, let me bring this around this Please. way. Once the studio system collapsed under the weight of uh, Washington with HUAC, and uh, this film we're going to see tomorrow night, I hope you, you all come, uh, it's a 50s film, and it perfectly describes why Hollywood was committing suicide, industrial suicide. As films went deeper into the 50s and all the best talent was blacklisted, the product became very mediocre. Uh, it was, it, it, films that were being made uh, had no substance. They had no, no uh, deeper thrust. Not all films, uh, it's a little bit of generalizing here, but uh, television, increasing union problems, fear of communism that had infiltrated the industry, and 
unions that had made films so expensive that they had to make fewer films, but not necessarily better films. Now, here's, here's the thing. Uh, I'll get to your question. Hollywood was finally declared a monopoly because it made the films, it distributed the films, and it owned the theaters that the films were shown in. And Washington, you know, keeping a, a, a more of an eye on Hollywood than on China, um, said, wait a minute. Um, you're locking out all these independent filmmakers who also have something to say. And that led to the end. They, so they had to break up. They had, they had to keep two of the three uh, aspects. Distribution, they kept and production they kept, and they gave out, they gave up distribution. Now look, production costs money. You pay out money. Distribution, in those days, physical film, cost money. So you're putting out money. Exhibition, where the films are shown, that's where you make money. So they, not thinking it through, they gave up the one aspect that was most profitable for them. Uh, by giving up ownership of the theaters. And by giving up ownership of the theaters, the theater owners became independent, and they began to book independent films because Hollywood films weren't drawing enough. It was the same old thing. It, it, actors were getting older. Clark Gable was still making movies. Marilyn Monroe was the symbol of um, sexuality. Uh, in America, a kind of a sterile, sterile stereotype of what uh, people wanted to believe was what women were. Um, they were all aging out of the industry. And young people who wanted to be in it, either as stars or actors or uh, producers, or directors had no interest in working with studios. Uh, they wanted to make films that extended this idea of personal style for themselves, not for Louis B. Mayer, not for Harry Cohn, for themselves. And so by 1960, when actually when Kirk Douglas hires a, a blacklisted writer for Spartacus from 1962, Dalton Trumbo. Nothing happened. Uh, he gave Trumbo credit. Uh, the film was made. It was a huge success, and it was produced by Kirk Douglas, by his own company, and made a ton of money around the world, uh, a kind of a... Um, uh, it, it, you know, it's a variation of the crucifixion story. Um, and th those always sell. I mean, uh, uh, and you'll see tomorrow. Tomorrow's film is, at the end of all the meanings, is a crucifixion film. Uh, and that's what's so powerful about it. So once film became an independent medium, stars became less important because you no longer needed the, the star power to sell a film. Uh, what you actually had was what you didn't see on film, independent producers, independent directors, um, actors who didn't yet have a name, who wanted to make a name, so they would work for less money in order to be to be in the movies. So when when you ask me and and other people ask me uh, who the young stars of uh, Hollywood are today, I can name very few. It's it's just like <laughs> not just like it's exactly like when I listen to music. And uh, having grown up with the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, and all that, I have no idea. I looked at a top 10 list of uh, music the other day on the internet and what was selling. 
and except for Taylor Swift, who dominates, she's going to be here tonight. Uh, she's everywhere, uh, Taylor Swift. Except for her, I have no idea who, who's making music today that means anything to anybody but 20-year-old kids. The same thing with film. Uh, there are a few people I like. I like Emma Stone. I think she's an interesting female. She goes against the grain of what we typically think are females. I like I like Russell Crowe before he uh, became Orson Welles. Um, there are people scattered around, but when I go to film to see a film, I don't say to myself, who's in it? Uh, that's what people did in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Who's in it? Oh, Clark Gable. Oh, I want to go see it. Cary Grant. Oh, I have to see it. Today, when I want to see a film, I say, who made it? And that, that is the difference. Uh, so uh, you all know all the young uh, filmmakers and all the young talent. Uh, my work, because I, for a number of reasons, which I uh, thankfully won't go into here, I find that Hollywood is in a place of transition and not in a good place. The industry of Hollywood now has recreated itself through television. Television is where the studios still have an influence. And in some cases, television is a better medium for film. Here's what I mean than, than film. Let's, talk, uh, let's take crime, okay? When you see a crime in a movie, especially those film noirs, those wonderful criminal world films. You have a crime, you usually have a detective or a police person. They go out, they run into a few bumps here and there, they get wounded in their shoulders, which magically goes away in the next scene. And they catch the guy. So what is the message? The message is that, uh, that justice prevails, right? And that symbolically, catching that criminal, you have caught all criminals. On television, crime never ends. Crime is constant. And the battle doesn't begin or end with an episode of, uh, let's say, Law and Order or CSI or any of these crazy programs uh, that do nothing but shoot each other and never hit them, always missing. Um, but it's a continuum, and so is television. So if you do a weekly series about crime, you are actually closer to the, to the um, chronic problem that we have in, in every country uh, about lawlessness. Uh, uh, but what they don't deal with are the reasons for the crime. Uh, Hollywood didn't, and television doesn't. Poverty, um, exclusion, racism, uh, um, very, very, um, very rarely does somebody come from a good family, a good upbringing, has the right color, and says, you know what? I was going to go to medical school, but instead I'm going to rob a bank. I mean, it just, it, you know, it doesn't play. It doesn't make any sense. So criminals in film are kind of demented people. You know, they, they, uh, they're anti-establishment. They're, I'm going to take on these, the, uh, I'm going to make my own money. I'm going to sell drugs. I'm going to have all the pretty women and all that. And none of that has anything to do with the real crime problems. And yet, Hollywood can sell that because it's much easier to sell that than it is to sell any program that deals with the real issues. So when you, when you look at film, you're not seeing the real world. You're seeing a representation of that world. And a lot of it has to do with passivity. All mass media has to do with passivity. You don't make movies or television shows to start an insurrection. You leave that to Donald Trump. 
um, you make you make movies that try to project the personality of the director, not only on the actors, but on the mise en scène, on the entire construct of the world of that screen. Those films are the films that attract young people to make, to be in, to produce, because they haven't bought the party line. They haven't been uh, in, in, inducted into this idea of uh, crime, of, of illicit, you fill in the blank. Um, and that's why independent films and foreign films, French films especially, deal with culture, with life, in an entirely different way uh, than Hollywood does. Hollywood is still selling Coca-Cola. It, it's still selling the Model T Ford, where today um, no one drives a Model T Ford and not a lot of people drink Coke from a bottle. But the industry believes that you keep selling the same thing. So the challenge for all you students out there who want to make films, my advice is stay away from Hollywood uh, because you will get sucked in by money, by what you think is prestige, uh, by the ability to make your film, but you'll really be making their film. So today, the idea of Hollywood is all over America. Uh, New York, Boston, Virginia, South Carolina, Seattle, Canada. Uh, these are all places that are far more active in uh, filmmaking than Hollywood, which still just makes crime shows and TV shows, shows where uh, in symbolically, Married couples are still sleeping in separate beds. Uh, children come from the stork. You know that's that's the that's what Hollywood sells us. Um, and independent films. Now we're going to show an independent film tomorrow in my um, uh, second year class. Uh, how many of you are here from that second? Uh, oh, quite, uh, we could have continued this at uh, at one o'clock. Um, this is a very daring and unusual film. And to me, it was made in 2012, the best film of that year, for me, from my perspective as, as a film critic and historian. Nobody else liked this film. And uh, um, if you look up the reviews, they're pretty awful. But what I see is the beginning of a, of a real independence in thinking. Who is in the film? I have no idea. I don't know who they are. Uh, none of them have a name, a famous name. None of them uh, are um, familiar. And that, if you think about it, that actually works better in film than having stars. Because when you have stars, you know you're going to be entertained. When you have people you don't know, they become part of the medium of film. Uh, they're much easier to believe and identify with than the old movie stars who um, people went to see just, just to see them. But without that element, you start looking at the film. You start looking at uh, what these younger people are saying and why. So that's my answer to you. <laughs> well, a very complex, long, and um, provocative answer. I asked you because there are some books here that you have written about the past uh, Hollywood icons. These are actors that my father watched all of their movies. Uh, John Wayne, for example, is still one of the greatest uh, cowboys of all time. Uh, whenever I see Jimmy Stewart, I always think of uh, what a wonderful day, even though he starred in a lot of uh, Hitchcock movies that you're watching. And so Charlie Heston is a classic always for um, Holly Week. Uh, so that's why I asked you, and there's some books here that are very interested to you. 
And in a way, I, I'll just say this and as an example to give you a little uh, time to make me drink some water, a little break. But I, I remember catching myself one day reading a tweet, a, a, a big series of tweets about their complicated relationship between Selena Gomez and Justin Bieber. And I remember reading about that because that's kind of the modern biography type where this person tracked their social media statuses, their Instagrams, and uh, you know, was telling how complicated their, their love life was. And I just thought that there's still room for a lot of biographies of these, um, these young people. And I wish, you know, if there was a book out on them, I would read it as well as I, I will read some of these. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, with, uh, and what you said about Hollywood, we still, a lot of us are still very attractive to the idea of Hollywood. Uh, and let me say this. I want to make this, this clear. I love Hollywood films. Um, they're my favorite films, uh, despite everything that I've talked about. Because of style of certain directors, and I'll name them, Wells, Hitchcock, Ford, Hawks, uh, Preminger, Kubrick, Kubrick at the end of the system. But these were people who had to overcome all kind of obstacles to be able to maintain their personal vision. And all the films that I show here and other places are mostly Hollywood films, because I'm trying to show you that uh, you, you called uh, uh, Steve McQueen a rebel. Yes, he's a rebel, but uh, that's what art is. Art, you have to be a rebel to go against the grain, to stand out, to make your point. So rebellion in art is a good thing. A rebellion is not a bad thing, although Hollywood liked to portray rebels as lunatics. Uh, rebel rebellion is a good thing, and uh, it's what made Hollywood what it what it was, and why I love it so much. Bravery, creativity, vision, and going against the wind, going against the forces to make your statement. And so today you face a different set of obstacles. But the goal is the same, to make yourself stand apart from the crowd, to rebel from the status quo, make your statement, and then see what happens. Let, let the chips fall, as they say. Um, when, I, when I teach Hollywood films, I always try to point out what is actually going on? And usually it's not the plot. Usually it's a question of personal style where the plot is used to move these characters. Uh, look at Hitchcock, uh, as, as we've been doing. Um, you know, I've said this before. Hitchcock, um, he made 52 films in his career, um, some in England, some here. And um, someone said that uh, he didn't make 52 films. He made one film 52 times. That is very much what the Hollywood system was about. Uh, and Hitchcock was able to overcome all of the restrictions. Uh, the train going through the tunnel at the end of North by Northwest um, by a personal style born out of all the angst and the repression and uh, um, uh, the, the desire to be somebody else, all of that comes through. So uh, that's why Hollywood is great, as opposed to all the things I told you that are not so great. You know, when you have a, a, um, a big enemy, you need a big hero. And so uh, those who made it through, they are the heroes of our culture. And that's why we admire them, and that's why we study them, to learn what the present is from what the past led these people to. So um, 
I don't want to give anybody the impression that I, I, I'm anti-Hollywood or anti-anything. I'm <laughs> pro everything in the world. So I, actually, that was um, I, that was my setup to ask you this. So when I said uh, <laughs> that, I, w I was setting up the question, which is why are there so many young entrepreneurs still drawn to Hollywood? Same old reason. Um, make money. Entrepreneurs make money, uh, and to make money, you need artists so that your film will be good enough for people to want to see. If you're an artist, you need people who can make these movies for you. So it's not really a clash of uh, today of entrepreneurs and, um, and artists. It's a it's an uneasy marriage, you know. It's a it's a, a it's a strained marriage where both both of the couple need each other. Um, today, entrepreneurs, uh, really as always, like to think of themselves as artists, and that's okay. We let them because whatever they want to think is fine, as long as they let us uh, do what we want to do. When I go to a publisher uh, with an idea, nobody at, uh, I think it was Warner Books, uh, nobody at, at Warner Books said, oh, John Wayne, what a great story. Oh, it's so powerful. They said, how much money can we make uh, from this book? So they understand that uh, their goal is to make money, but they need good product to make that money. And that's where the artist holds some kind of power. But you've got to prove it. You've got to prove that you can do it. And that's what this stage of your training is really about. UFM and other film schools are putting you through boot camp, you know, to get ready for the war in the real world. You are learning. You are being trained. You are being shown the mechanics so you can magically, almost mystically, turn those mechanics into art that will get noticed and will bring you to the next phase of your career. Well, thank you for that. And it's always hard to, to teach creativity yep. and also to have an institutional place to teach you to be reflective, intuitive, because this is what makes great art, not, also, not only doing, but also moments to reflect and to think about what you want to do before you do it. So with that in mind, I want to ask you the last question I have prepared, and then I'll open the mic for, for anyone's question, is how has the rise of independent film in the last few years affected or impacted Hollywood? Well, uh, and, and as, as I mentioned, Hollywood has turned to television um, because it's um, television is, you can watch any episode of any of these shows and it's the same thing um, over and over and over again. And people like that. Uh, people like to know that uh, the cops are not going to be killed, that the bad guys are going to be caught. And, and there's... Usually, very little backstory in those in those programs. Uh, you don't know where these cops live. Uh, you don't know why they became police. Uh, it, it's all very surfacey. It's it's all very skimming along on a on a surface. Um, independent filmmakers want to go below the surface. They want to see what's what's um, really there. What's structurally there. What's uh, uh, the iconography of Hollywood. They want to change it. You, you want to change it. You want to take the cliche out of heroism and portray heroes. Um, you, you want to show people on screen who are in some aspects projections of your own style or if you want to call it talent or if you want to call it personality. And, and here's what I mean. You don't have to know that Hitchcock was 
crazy to um, appreciate a Hitchcock film. You can see it and, and have no idea who he is and still get the message. The more you know about him, the more profound that message gets. So one of the reasons independent films are so important is if you can keep on making them, then your body of work will reveal your ability, your talent, uh, your style, your consistency. And hopefully uh, that, will, uh, that will give you not just a living, but a life. Uh, um, and you're very brave to go to film school, I think, because if you go to medical school, chances are you'll be a doctor if you graduate. If you go to law school, unfortunately, you'll be a lawyer when you, when you graduate. But it, it's pretty well you know, set up um, in the system. But when you're an artist and you want to make something of, of value, you're taking a chance. You're throwing yourself into a pool of other artists, and it's a kind of a Darwinian thing. But don't get me wrong. Please, please don't get me wrong. If you want to make commercial films, if you want to make films that don't have personal statements, be my guest. I mean, there's nothing inherently wrong with, uh, say, television or traditional filmmaking or any of that, if that's what you want to do. Um, but for that, I don't think you need to put yourself through the torture of listening to me. You, you can uh, go out and learn the craft on, on, on the battlefield. You have, to, you have to know what your goal is, what you want to do, who you want to be, um, so that you can make that living at the same time you make that life. And um, so you're all very brave, I think, and courageous. And that puts you at an advantage because you get through this hurdle, the rest of it, it's a little easier. It's, it's, uh, you've gotten through the first phase. Now you go into the, uh, you, you've gone through the minor leagues, let's say, and then you go in and play professional ball. Um, that's, that's why um, I love uh, film schools so much because I see myself in you 10 years ago. What? Uh, um, <laughs> five years. Uh, uh, five years ago. <laughs> um, and, and my direction was always uh, to write, to write about myself through the people I identify with. And um, that's what I did, and it, it wasn't easy, but I survived and uh, lived to tell the tale. I remember when I, uh, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but <laughs> when, um, when I told my mother, uh, she said to me one day, what do you want to be when you grow up? I was already 20 years old. So, what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, I said, I want to be a writer. And I remember she started crying. Uh, I'll send you to law school. I'll send my kid brother to law school. Um, and that's what you face. That, that's what you face from your peers, your parents, uh, your rich uncle, you know, or the guy who's jingling coins in his pocket saying, hey, let me put you in business. You face all of that. And you use the power of youth the strength of youth to be free of all of that and go out and conquer the world. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Well, Thank I, you. Was that because I, my mother was crying? Is that why you're, <laughs> why you're clapping? Well, uh, you said some beautiful things there, but I, I do believe that you know, knowing who you are and finding your way in the world um, takes us, some of us, some time, and I think that's what youth is, and uh, also going to school, you know, it gives you a time to figure out what you want to do later. So I, I know that a lot of souls here, I, a lot of people here are soul searching and trying to find their way, and, and I'm sure they will, and I, I hope that they'll pro produce 
uh, beautiful work of, of arts in the near future. So with that in mind, I would like to listen to your questions. So many of us, well, at least from my point of view, many of us are trying to avoid making movies like Hollywood. What is your advice to avoid doing that? Don't go to Hollywood. <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> you know, if, if what you're saying is that you don't want to fall into the commercial status quo, in today's world of film, there are so many independent directors, great screenwriters, and um, people who will get involved in film, as I said, because they think money is art. Um, you don't have to go that route. Uh, you, you don't have to follow the crowd. Uh, make your own crowd. And, and um, you know, that's what, uh, that's what Clint Eastwood did. Um, when he was rejected by film, uh, the story that you were telling, or I was telling up there, whoever that guy was, um, <laughs> when he was in TV, he wanted to direct an episode. And he'd been on Rawhide for five or six years, was a Western, a non-Western Western on TV, uh, at a time when there were 28 Westerns on a week. And when he got to the set and he said, all right, I want this shot to be this way, the union guys who couldn't care less about anything except breaks and vacations and raises and all of that, they didn't want to move the camera. It was too much work. Uh, they said, this is the way you do it. This is how you do it. And uh, Clint broke away from that and became the outsider formed his own production company in a time when that was not easy or less easy to do than today. And like in all revolutions, and this was a creative revolution, eventually all the studios wanted to be like him instead of him uh, not wanting to be like them. So you can win. So if, if you don't want to go to Hollywood, I, the simple answer is don't go and start your own Hollywood. You know, put up a sign. Um, what's your last name? Bracamonte. Okay, well, whatever yeah. that last name is. <laughs> Bracamonte. Bracamonte. Put land on the end of it. So, Bracamonte land. And you create your own Hollywood. And, uh, you know, we will come and see you. We believe that you have to see every film of a director, and here's why. And I may have, some of you may have heard this before. If you see one film, one Hitchcock film, that's the best Hitchcock film you have ever seen. <laughs> if you see two Hitchcock films, one of them is the best, one of them is the second best. And as you add films to that, you begin to understand which films work, which films don't, but the most important thing about that is that the difference between a minor artist and a major artist, and you, you can see it in painting uh, with Picasso and Van Gogh, that the development is one way. The progression of their art goes from early, middle, to end. And by the end, they are masters of uh, their work. If you see early Hitchcock, you haven't seen Hitchcock. If you see middle Hitchcock, you haven't seen Hitchcock. If you see late Hitchcock, especially late Hitchcock up to Psycho, you don't understand the progression of Alfred Hitchcock as a stylist and as a personality-driven director. So that all of these films progress. You go from Strangers on a Train to Rear Window to Vertigo to North by Northwest. And finally, the problem is solved of, um, of this um, good, bad qualities that Hitchcock and his characters struggle with until you come to Psycho, where he finally figures out 
that it's one character. You don't need two separate characters to express good and bad. It's all in Tony Perkins. If you just see Psycho, it doesn't have the same impact. You don't have the same understanding. It's like seeing one Picasso. If you see all of Hitchcock, as he finally approaches Psycho, you have watched him resolve his issues as an artist. And so we believe, don't see one John Ford, see as many John Fords as you can, and you will understand who John Ford is. That's auteurism. And what, what we've done this year, we've uh, created a dialectic in our classes where we watch films that relate to each other either by the same director or the same story by different directors to understand that the difference is in the how you tell the story. That is the difference. And so the reason you need to see films is how you learn about films. Uh, you can't learn about films from a textbook. You can read criticism, you can, you can read novels, but you need to see films and see the progression of a major artist. And uh, that's why um, it's important to see a body of work. If you read Charles Dickens, you take it to novel. You read one Charles Dickens book, you don't know who Charles Dickens is. But if you read the works of Charles Dickens, if you live to be 200 years old, you'll finish that. Um, then you know who Charles Dickens was. Then you understand who he was. <laughs> so you were mentioning how a lot of the people that you've written your works on have this kind of like rebellion, you know, and, that, and that's what a great artist tends to be. But I was wondering if during, you know, your research and your, your reading about all these icons, if there's any other characteristic that you found was kind of like a pattern, like every time you worked on one person and then another and then another, you said, you know, these characteristics keep on coming up in these icons and people that I write about, maybe something we could learn from them. That's a good question. Uh, when, I, when I write, uh, I'm writing uh, the story of uh, John Wayne or Steve McQueen as I understand it as I understand it. So there were, there have been maybe 25 John Wayne books at, at least, but mine, or for better or for worse, approached him from an auteurist place because an auteurist can be an actor. Uh, in, in certain, Marlon Brando, an auteurist actor. And I, I try to approach them to show the man in the work and the work in the man filtered through my own emotional connection to them. I only write about people who I am moved by. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of these people were rejected by the artistic community especially John Wayne, the most underrated actor in Hollywood. Uh, Steve McQueen, um, brief, uh, mostly unpopular career. Uh, Charlton Heston, career ruined by one sentence, you know, uh, over my dead body, on my dead hands. Um, uh, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, Jimmy Stewart was a war hero who, uh, in World War II, who suffered severe brain damage. And that worked for Hitchcock so beautifully. He became one of Hitchcock's favorite actors. But when, by the time Hitchcock got to him, Hollywood had changed. The Hollywood of 1940, before the war, was not the Hollywood of 1945. Uh, most of the actors who had gone in the war, were now too old to be leading men. Uh, most of them had suffered some kind of uh, emotional pain or physical pain from seeing battles, and they were no longer uh, able to be traditional 
leading men. So I look for that. I, I look for, uh, you know, we call it a rebel. You could also call it an underdog. You could also call it a, an anti-hero. Um, you could call it someone who the crowd rejects. That, that to me is appealing. Why? What's so great about these people? And why doesn't everybody in the world love them? What is it? What happened to them? What did they do? How did they formulate who they are? Um, and that, that's, that's what I look for. And, you know, for better or for worse, some people would say better, some people would say worse. Um, that, to me, is what biography is. And uh, that's what I look for. Hi, Mark. Um, what do you think is the biggest challenge as young filmmakers? And how do you think that we can overcome that challenge? Good question. The biggest challenge is uh, not to compromise. Uh, that, to me, is the biggest challenge. Um, if I were 20, I wouldn't surrender my dreams uh, for somebody else's, uh, for the sake of money, recognition. At, at 20, uh, you are your dreams, and uh, you need to see if you can live up to them. Uh, whether you can make that your life. Uh, the, whole, the whole idea of being an artist and transferring something inside of you that is personal and individual to a screen that is universal, the ultimate answer is it's mystical. There's a mystical quality about the ability to make something out of a thought. Uh, if you want to make a, a, a table, it's not that mystical. You get nails, hammers, uh, saws, whatever, and you can make it. it it's, uh, it's a physical object. But a thought, an emotion, a desire to express that emotion and to somehow like uh, <laughs> like bluetooth make it make it arrive without wires you know somehow magically send it to the screen and people you never met you have no idea who they are where they are see it and say yes uh, that's me up there that's a mystical process. And really, what you learn is the instrumentation of your craft, the, uh, the realities of your craft, and then you study those who are mystics. And um, you try, when you step out, to to the big leagues, let's say, you have to find that that uh, that Bluetooth in you. You have to find the ability to get what you're saying on the screen that is both individual and universal. So, if you if you've seen somebody that you like, look at that person. Look at that person's work. So, what is it that I like about it? What works? Why do I like this film? Uh, what is it about it that I like? So it's not just enough to say, oh, I like it. Uh, look at it and say, what, what is it? What do I like? When, what does it mean when I say I like? Um, so, uh, you know, there is a world of opportunity out there waiting for you uh, if you can swing the bat and hit the ball. Uh, and, uh, really as simple as that. If you can get up and be um, be Kobe Bryant in a basketball game, you, you'll make it. I mean, that's, that's the way destiny will bring you. Uh, and the only way you know is if you try. So if you don't try, you'll never know. Uh, we have the what could have been thing. You've got to go out and do it. But here, we arm you, so when you go to battle, you can shoot back. 
We are giving you the, the weapons to fight the battle. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, that, that's what, um, another way to say inspiration, I guess. And th that inspiration is so strong that it, it's not a choice. It, it's, it's, uh, it's a need, it's a desire. It's a feeling, it's an itch that has to be scratched. Um, and, you know, even if it makes your mother cry, you still want to do it. And it may, by the way. Um, yeah, there is a moment in Toy Story, you've probably all seen it. The characters are looking for the mystical portal. And all of a sudden, they cross it. And the characters say, mystical portal. So I'm sure that if you're looking for it, you'll find it. So please continue looking for that. With this question, we wrap up. So I want to close this activity. Um, I want to thank you all and everyone that joined us uh, for joining us today. And thank you for sharing this time with Mark. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.